The usual estimate from the IPCC is that a doubling of CO2 gives you about three and a half watts per meter squared. I don't care if it's, you know, plus or minus a half. And uh, as we saw before, that's about 2% of the incoming and outgoing values. And we changed the surface temperature about one degree centigrade. There's a problem with the characteristic emission level, which I should mention right off the bat. Uh, it's endemic. The infrared actually comes from a number of levels. Uh, the most obvious ones are the surface in the infrared window. Uh, the characteristic emission level for the gases and then the infrared that emerges from the upper level cirrus clouds. Um, the interesting thing is that both CO2 and clouds act to close the window for this. Um, and where you have the clouds, these levels don't matter. That, that does change things a little bit or more than a little bit, I should say. The upper level cirrus coverage is on the order of 35%. And this is not negligible. These are very thin clouds. They're barely visible. Sometimes they're not visible. The typical altitude for these clouds is about 10 kilometers, where the temperature is about 223 degrees Kelvin. Once you consider this, the characteristic emission level away from these clouds is actually 268, which puts it much lower. Uh, there are a couple of things to note with the clouds. They also reflect shortwave radiation. This is something we mentioned, that the upper level cirrus often have substantial infrared opacity with little reflectivity. And when clouds are below the characteristic emission level for gases, they don't impact things much. It's only when they're above. OK, calculations of radiator forcing to a doubling of CO2 tend to ignore the shielding effect of upper level cirrus clouds. Um, this is worth noting. Right? Let, let's for the moment consider that the radiative forcing we're talking about is 3 watts per meter squared. Um, you know, the discussion, all the discussion we're having makes it sound as though we're talking about a big thing. We're talking about a little thing. We don't measure to this accuracy. Moreover, such small changes can be caused by many, many things. So, for example, uh, when you're talking about upper level cirrus, which are very variable, a 10% change in their area or 500 meter change in altitude give you three watts per meter squared. And fluctuations of this magnitude and even larger are common. Um, if the changes are caused by changes in surface temperature, they're feedbacks. But there are many things that can cause such changes. And as a result, most of them are not feedbacks. They're just noise in the system from this point of view. But they can all override this little change if you doubled CO2. I think ultimately, and I can't give you this at the moment, all these changes should be viewed as what I would call degrees of freedom, whereby a climate system can adjust to any sort of imbalance. In any event, let's continue with feedback. What does that mean? Well, we usually view the system as having a node. This is the system. It has a zero feedback gain. You force it with certain radiative forcing, and you get out a temperature. And this is the one degree if this is the 3 and a half watts per meter squared. Um, if you have feedback, what it's saying is the change in delta T gives rise to a change in the flux in the system so that the total flux 
is a response not just to the original delta Q, but also to this feedback factor. And if you solve for it, you get this. Or more accurately, accurately is a relative issue, to the sum of all the feedback factors. The thing to notice about this is the expression for delta T is singular. If the sum of the feedback factors equals one, you are getting infinite response. Of course, that's not real. We know that, you know, simple resonance gives you infinite response, but there's always any little thing will prevent it from being infinite. Nevertheless, it's worth keeping in mind because this is just another picture of how to view it. You know, you have the incoming you add greenhouse gas, and then you add something like water vapor or something, and uh, you increase the imbalance in a positive feedback. But in the real climate system, you can also have negative feedbacks. Let's just skip this. This is an important curve to understand, because we'll come back to it a number of times. This is the response of the system in terms of the total feedback factor. And remember, I said it's singular. So, and it's the sum of the various feedback factors. So if you start out with, let's say, 0.5, anything you add to it gives you a huge increase in the response. But if you are in this area here, uh, changes in the feedback factor do very little. This is the nature of a function 1 over 1 minus f. Um, this is just the words that I've said. You know, the pos for positive feedbacks, small variations in the feedback lead to large changes in response. And for negative feedbacks, large variations in the feedback lead to only small changes in the response. Um, Essentially, any degree of freedom that can provide 3 watts per meter squared is also large enough to provide feedback factors of plus or minus 1. That's why the range of uncertainty has remained so large over the years. In all current models, and this is important, there is something they call the water vapor feedback, which provides F equals 0.5, that is to say, it brings you to here. And as a result, any additional small feedbacks can lead to huge sensitivity. So for instance, with 0.5, it's 1 over 1 minus 0.5 gives you 2. That's fine. Then somebody adds 0.3 to that, that's even smaller than the water vapor feedback, you're suddenly at 5. <coughs> If somebody were to add 0.5 again, you're infinite. So that's, that's the issue in the uncertainty. Um, there's another feature here that we'll focus on, and uh, Nier mentioned it. A sensitivity can also be expressed as a ratio at the surface of flux to temperature change, OK? A highly sensitive system has a very big delta T for a very small flux. That's also a measure of the coupling of the atmosphere and the ocean. If you have a very small flux, no matter how big the delta T, you're still going to, by the first law of thermodynamics, have to use that flux to reach that delta T. So it'll take longer and longer and longer the more sensitive you are. And there are a lot of issues with this. We'll mention some of them. But one of the things that suggests a problem with the field, you all probably have heard of things like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the Atlantic Multidecadal. These are names, uh, don't take the names literally, but they represent the fact that in the Earth's climate, there are fluctuations on long time scales, ranging from 10 to 60 and even longer times. 
that involve the interaction of the atmosphere and the ocean. This is best worked out for El Nino and so, but the others also have that characteristic. No model gets those things in a reasonable manner. And so I've suggested that since they all involve interactions of the atmosphere and the ocean, why not rig a model? You, you can make a model that will be less sensitive artificially and see if those models do better on the Pacific Decadal Oscillation or on ENSO or any of these things. I have yet to find a modeling group that will try that. So, you know, that's one of the unfortunate features. Now, in trying to assess the sensitivity, the natural thing to consider is that the temperature record itself should tell you something. This is not rigorously true, though I think the record is very suggestive. Um, this figure you've seen already, Essentially, the IPCC, in arguing for attributing the warming that appears between about 1960 and 1997 to anthropogenic emissions, I should add, not greenhouse emissions, total emissions, including aerosols, we'll come back to that, uh, does not give you the observed warming. So they say, well, we're pretty sure that means since we can't think of anything else, it must be this. Everyone knows that's a stupid argument. And in particular, you know, all sorts of things could be this. You've heard people suggest it might be a solar effect. But there are plenty of variations on this level. We're talking about tenths of a degree, for crying out loud, that uh, are always occurring. Indeed, if you plot the warming that was actually occurring, not the model results, uh, between 1920 and 1940, it's indistinguishable from this. So their argument in the IPCC is that they need anthropogenic influences after 1960. 